While we took a break, our workman found the oil clearance to be acceptable. However, when he had visually checked the bearing shells, he noticed indications of high spots in the lower bearing shell. This is where you expect to find high spots, since the shaft in a plain journal bearing is mainly supported by the lower rather than the upper bearing shell. So he's preparing to perform a contact check between the bearing journal and the lower shell of the bearing. The results of this check will allow him to determine whether or not there are high spots in the shell. And in addition, they will allow him to check the alignment of the bearing with the shaft of the pump. So let's join him down at the pump and see how this particular procedure is performed. First, he removes the protective cover, which was previously placed over the lower bearing housing, and of course was protecting the journal as well. This is because he needs access to the journal to perform this test. With the cover removed and set aside, he needs to verify the cleanliness of the parts involved before doing the test. So he uses a clean, lint-free rag to wipe any excess oil from the surface of the bearing journal or the bearing housing. Now it's important when doing this that only clean rags and only lint-free rags be used to avoid contamination of the bearing parts. And also that care is used to avoid anything which might scratch or scar the bearing journal. So as we see here, he wipes excess oil from the journal all the way around the journal and then sets the rag aside. The next thing he does is to apply a coating of machinist blue dye compound to the bearing journal. Now this dye compound is available in many different types and forms from different manufacturers. So the compound you use may appear somewhat different than the one you see here. But the important thing to remember, regardless of the type used, is to apply a smooth, even, and relatively thin coating of dye to all portions of the bearing journal. It's important that the coating be thin or you'll get a false reading. And it's also important that the coating be even, that is, that all portions of the journal be covered, or again, you'll get a false reading. So as we see here, he applies a small amount of dye compound and then carefully spreads it in an even coating all over the bearing journal and all the way around the bearing journal, reaching down under the shaft to make sure that area is covered as well. Once the bearing journal has been completely covered with blue dye compound, he's ready to go on to the next step in the procedure. And that next step is to reinstall the lower bearing shell. So he wipes the excess dye from his hands. Then he takes the lower bearing shell and he wipes it off with a clean, lint-free rag to remove any excess oil which may be on it before installing it. Now he rolls it into position by essentially reversing the procedure that we've seen earlier. He checks the reference marks on the shell and on the bearing housing to be sure it's installed in the proper orientation. Then he carefully places it into position on the shaft, taking care not to scar the bearing journal and not to damage the slinger ring, before rolling the shell down into position in the lower half of the housing. Then with the shell in position, he needs to lower the shaft down on the shell. So he removes the hardwood wedges and wooden block which he had previously placed under the coupling to raise the shaft. This then places the weight of the shaft on the bearing shell. The next thing he needs to do after getting the block out of the way is to turn the shaft. This will transfer the die compound from the journal to the shell. The pattern of die compound then remaining on the shell indicates the degree of contact between these two parts. So after getting the block out of the way, he places a strap wrench on the coupling so he can turn the shaft without causing damage. If the wrong tool was used, a pipe wrench for example, damage could occur to the shaft or to the coupling. He turns the shaft a small amount in one direction and then reverses the strap wrench to allow him to turn it in the opposite direction. There's no need to turn the journal an entire 360 degrees. In fact, that's really not a good idea. All you need is a small amount of motion to transfer the dye compound. If you turn it too much, you'll transfer too much dye and get a fault reading. After turning the shaft, he removes the strap wrench. Now he's ready to retrieve the lower bearing shell. To do this, he has to reinstall his block and hardwood wedges to lift the shaft off the shell. 
So he sets the block in position and then as before taps the wedges in with a hammer. This raises the shaft just a few thousandths of an inch to allow removal of the shell. After doing this, the shell is then removed following exactly the same procedure we saw earlier. But now, since it's been out and back in once or twice, it's not bound up anymore, so it can be turned out by hand. And then, as before, he uses a metal pin in one of the oil drain holes to turn it completely around to allow removal. Again, let me emphasize, he uses care to avoid the possibility of scarring or damaging the journal or the slinger ring. Then he examines the blue dye compound. Now what he finds here is exactly what he expected to find. There are two high spots, one at each end of the bearing shell. To correct this condition, a small amount of the material has to be removed from the high spots. This is referred to as scraping a bearing. And the reason for that terminology is obvious, because the way this is done is simply to take a sharp tool and scrape away bearing material. But exercise care when doing this. It requires a gentle touch. As I said before, this is Babbitt material, which means it's a very soft metal alloy. So scraping it doesn't require a lot of force at all. You don't want to remove much material. As we see here, all the workman is doing is scraping away enough material to eliminate the blue dye compound that was transferred. That way, he's just removing the high spots. It's best to remove too little rather than too much. These steps may have to be repeated two or three times, but that's fine. If you scrape out too much material, then it has to be replaced again, and that's a much more complex process. So he scrapes away the indicated high spot on one end of the shell, and then turns it around and repeats the same process on the other end. Now he does the same thing on this end. That is, he scrapes away only enough material to remove the blue dye compound. And while doing this, he uses a careful stroking motion to be sure that no sharp edges, nicks, or gouges result. Only a very thin layer of the surface of the Babbitt material needs to be scraped away. And as I said before, removing too much of the material is going to cause him problems. So he'd rather remove too little rather than too much. When he's done scraping, he carefully wipes the bearing as usual, using a clean, lint-free cloth. This removes any remaining metal particles. And he feels the bearing by hand to be sure that he's left no sharp edges. Now, at this point, he needs to repeat the contact check procedure that we just saw. First, however, he checks to see that he's still got a good, thorough coating of dye on the journal. So, using his hand, he spreads the dye compound around to ensure that he has a thorough, even coating. Next, he reinstalls the lower shell and repeats all the steps that we've just seen until he gets an acceptable pattern of dye on the shell. And what is an acceptable dye pattern? Well, it's coverage from one end of the shell to the other. Now, you'll notice that coverage is not all the way up on the diameter of the shell. You'll recall what we discussed earlier about oil clearance or running clearance. The shells have a larger diameter than the shaft. So the only portion of the shell that's covered with blue dye is the portion actually in contact with the shaft. Now the checks that we have just seen can be performed in another way if necessary. The two bearing shells can be assembled around a mandrel of appropriate diameter. In this way, contact is checked with both bearing shells. However, as I explained before, the worker had two reasons for doing it the way we've just seen. First, he already suspected that the high spots were on the lower half of the bearing because of his past experience. Second, this let him check the alignment of the bearing housing with the shaft. And he found proper alignment. But what would improper alignment look like? Well, it would result in a die pattern which indicated that the shaft wasn't straight in the bearing shell. If this had been the case, further investigation would be required because this would indicate an out-of-alignment condition of the pump itself. Well, I'll tell you what, while our workman continues to repeat the steps we've just seen, performing contact checks and scraping the bearing as 